Hey, First Assembly, this is Pastor Wes. I want you to grab a Bible, get a comfortable seat, and let's get into the Word of God. Hey, it's so good to be with you tonight. And we have been in a series on change, and we've been looking at what does it mean to be a student of yourself. And I, and I think this is such a big thing. Uh, I think more people need to do this. I think more of our lives need to be about this. And it's this, uh, because it is on us to grow us. I want to say that again. We have to be a student of ourselves because it is on us to grow us. It is my responsibility to work at healing my life, my life and not wait on everyone else around me to do these things for me. I have to make choices in my life to be healthy. I have to make choices in my life to live mature. I have to make choices in my life to handle things in a godly way, even if other people don't. I can forgive and let go, but I have to make the choice and live the choices of my life. And I can promise you, no matter what situation that you are in today, there is a path to health. There is a way to grow and mature from it, even if it is a painful one. You know, we kind of think of painful seasons as something we just get through rather than grow through. Uh, and, and that impacts how I do and what I do, because the thing is this, to get through, you bunker down, you grit it out, you just bear it until it's better. But the struggle is often in even painful things. If there are lessons that I'm to learn and I don't learn them, I tend to come back to that type of thing until I learn what I'm being taught. So we can be responsible at times for creating our own struggles. Uh, but to grow through requires you to be a student of yourself. Why do I do what I do? Why did I feel what I feel? Why did what they did make me so frustrated or so angry? Why did that situation make me so afraid? What are the deeper things? Because as we discover and elevate truth in our life, we find freedom. And so we took some time last week. We looked at this. What are you growing towards? We're all growing towards something. We're all heading somewhere. We're all running a race to something. What are you growing towards? Uh, we talked about deliberate practice and strategic learning and growth designed to move you towards a specific goal. When you have in your mind where you want to be and who you want to be, all of a sudden that becomes a filter for every opportunity and every decision that you're making moving forward. And that can be a healthy thing that can keep you out of some wrong stuff and keep you focused in on the right stuff. It keeps us intentional and it keeps us on track. It keeps us from losing time and resource on things that are only going to take us places that we really don't want to go and becoming people that we really don't want to become. And so I know that people struggle because they don't always feel like they're living their lives. And, and what I mean by that is this, you know, you at a younger kind of said, I imagine my life at this time, at this stage, at this place, I'm going to have this and obtain this and I'll have this title. I'll be married and have 2.5 kids and a little house with a white picket fence. And all of a sudden you're at that age and your life doesn't look anything like that. And you're kind of wondering what went wrong. Why didn't the picture become the reality? How do I get to that place? And, and again, sometimes it's innocent enough. Sometimes we end up in places that we don't want to be simply because we didn't have a place we determined to grow towards. All right. And all of a sudden you go, what am I doing here? Why am I in this position? You know, I wanted to be financially secure. Why am I living paycheck to paycheck? I wanted to be in a committed relationship. Why am I not, you know, even seeing someone? What, what, what is happening? How did I end up the place that I ended up? And the reality of things is this. We, through choices of our lives, build bridges to where we're going. So we are where we are because bridges were built there. Now, if you're in a good place, you feel good about that. If you're in a place you look and go, hey, I'm checking boxes, I feel great. But if you're not, you hate it. You know, you didn't choose for your company to make cuts. You didn't choose for someone to say, hey, I don't think I want this anymore. Walk away. You didn't choose for sickness to come and find you. That wasn't your choice. But you know what? While there are things that come to our lives that we didn't choose, we do choose how we handle it. We do choose how we engage in that. And that's on us. I choose what I do with it. I choose my mindset about it. I, and what I choose will shape my actions and my actions impact how I live forward. 
All right, the other day I asked you, do you uh, know where you are right now? And I want to ask you a different question to kind of replace that one. Do you like where your life is right now? Do you like who you are right now? And are you moving forward intentionally or is your life simply caught in the current of life? You know, you're waking up in the morning and getting through your day and not determining here's where I want to end my day. I'm just tired at the end of my day and want to go to sleep. See, we have no issues looking back at our lives and seeing how we've changed and grown and become. Uh, but yet we struggle sometimes looking ahead and saying, I'm going to change. I'm going to continue to become. And we can get stuck thinking, this is who I am and this is what I'm going to be. But, we, uh, you know, like, but we're going to grow. We're going to continue to become. So don't let the devil trick you. You know, don't let the devil take a picture of you in your worst moment and then use that picture con to convince you that's who you are. Um, you're becoming, you're growing, you're changing. You can learn things and you can mature emotionally. You can live your life. You can be in a constant state of becoming because God has started his work in you and God is faithful to it until he returns. And so even if I have failed, that's not who I am. I failed there, but I'm a different person now. And, and, you know, I learn, I grow. I don't have to make the same mistake again. So you can change, will change. And so our hearts need to be focused on who am I becoming? You know, what is the target of my life? What are you aiming for today? What are you growing towards? Uh, and so how do you need to change the way that you think so that you can be transformed into the person that you're aiming at? You know, Romans 12, God transforms us. It's through him and the power of the Holy Spirit. We're changed by changing the way we think. He goes on to say that this is his work. He started in you and he'll continue that work. Philippians 1, 6, God's not bailing on you. He loves you. He'll continue his work to grow you and to help you to become. And what will we become? 1 Peter 5, 10, complete, steady, strong, and firm. This is what God does in our lives. He's done it for me. He'll do it for you. He does it for all of us. And so I love that no matter what our gifting is, no matter what our talent is, no matter what our ability is, we all fit into this. God's not working harder for one person than the other. No matter who you are, you're fashioned by God. And God will continue that work until the day we step into glory or He comes back. His work of making you complete and steady and strong and firm so that we hear, well done, Thou good and faithful servant. I love that. He doesn't list a gifting or list a job, but a state of mind and a state of heart. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, I'm faithful and I will not grow weary in doing good type of a spirit. That's what he's talking about. And the thing is this, we can feel like we're called to more. And in the culture that we're living in, it always wants more. You know, the struggles when you get more, uh, you, you, more, you just want more. You know, when I get something, I want something else. You know, when I get something good, I want more good. And we do that. And so the connection to our sin or to our flesh is that these things are never satisfied. You know, it's like an unending appetite of stuff. But here's the thing. I think that God made us with a desire for more. He made us with a desire for significance but it's different than the world's significance. We're called to be the right kind of more. You're uniquely created. You are uniquely gifted and called. In Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 4, it says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body, one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. <coughs> and so we read something like this and it says we're called. And when you and I think called, when we think calling, we think of doing. And, and I get it. What job? What task? What ministry? God's called me to do something. And, and so I get these things. But we can be so focused on the doing that we miss something that I think is critical. And the critical is before it's the do, we got to talk about the who. Who has called me? Who are they calling me to be? It's the who before the do. 
All right. So Genesis 12, God called Abraham to a land that he would show him. He says in Genesis 12, 4, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. So there was no do, but there was only the who, the Lord, that it was about honoring God with his life. And so in Ephesians 4, we're called to live a life worthy of the calling. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserve it, but because that was His plan from the beginning of time to show us His grace through Christ Jesus. We're not just called to life. We're called to a holy life. And so, yes, we're all called to ministry. We're all called to serve. We're all called to obedience. We're all called to do, but not before we establish the who of our life. Philippians 3.8 says, What more I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I might gain Christ. In Colossians 3.17, And whatever you do, there's that word, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. There's the who, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And so whatever God would have you do, God wants you to go or or where God would have you go is secondary to the foundation of our lives in Christ. Whatever God has for you to do, do it for Jesus. Wherever God puts you to serve, you serve Jesus. That's the calling. And so no matter what I'm doing, I'm serving the Lord. No matter where I am, I'm serving Jesus. If you're a plumber, if you're a banker, if you do construction, if you have an office job, if you're a pastor, if you work with children in a daycare, it doesn't matter. Who I'm working for is Christ. That's the call. Wherever He puts me, I serve Jesus. Jesus. Our lives have to be built in the foundation of who. You see, your calling is more about who you are becoming. Because again, we all feel like our lives are called to more, but the more I become like him, the more I feel like that is satisfied in me. The more that you're looking light is really found in the becoming of your lives. Another way of saying it is this. We're called first to salvation, then to sanctification, and then to serving. Now, sanctification and serving often work hand in hand. They walk together uh, until we get to glory. You know, I love uh, Jeff Anderson said, listen, Jesus didn't clean the fish before he caught them. You know, we are saved. We come to this realization of I need a Savior and I ask Jesus into my heart to be the Savior of my life. And in that moment, God, He cleanses me. He makes me whole. But in that moment also, He then begins a process of teaching me to live right as I'm serving. As I'm doing, those things work together. So your calling might look differently than my calling, and that's okay. The process is the same. Saved, sanctification, and serving. All right? We're all called to save, but then God begins His work. Developing us, using our gifts for our good, for His glory, for the advancement of the kingdom. Serving is about what you were gifted to do by God. But before we get to do that, we have to put our faith in the right person. And that's the person of Jesus. And so once I have my faith in the right who, then I can start becoming the right who through sanctification. I know it's a little confusing, but we're going to get there. All right. Salvation, we're freed. Sanctification is learning how to live in that freedom and to continue to become. Because again, we're all going to change. Look back 10 years to today, you're not the same person. And I'm telling you, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, you are going to continue to change. So we want to change on purpose and we can live holy. Romans 8, 29 says, chosen to be conformed to the image of his son. See, too often we want to know what we're supposed to do. God, what do you want me to do? And I think we get the cart in front of the horse prioritize putting your faith in Jesus and walk with God and allow God to change you, grow you, transform you by changing the way that you think so that you will become more like Jesus. And then I do what flows naturally. Then what I do kind of flows out of my heart because I'm more like Christ. I've become more like him. And the do can be anything. That's the thing is do doesn't always have to be ministry. It can be anything. You can be a librarian and that's your ministry. You can be a banker. That's your ministry. Wherever you are, wherever you are, um, God is with you and we can be the person that God has created us to be, okay? The doing portion of our faith can be a lot of things, but what's powerful about that is this. When you do, what you do is connected to the right who, it's never small 
and it's never signif- or insignificant. All right, when well, my first connection to Christ, my who, and he's changing me and growing me, and then I do the calling, I'm doing it for him. That is never a small thing. So you think maybe taking some time and spending more time with your kids might be a small thing. It's a powerful thing when Christ is in it. You know, taking some time and picking up the phone every other day to call and check somebody might be a small thing in your mind. But when Christ has led it, it's a significant thing. And great things can come out of those things. In Mark chapter 10, James and John were both wanting positions. And they speak to Jesus. And like, listen, when you come into power, can we have the positions to your right and to your left? And, and Jesus takes this whole moment and makes it a teaching thing about leadership and serving. He's saying, listen, if you're going to follow me, you got to understand something. It's about flipping things upside down. You've got to think differently about what is big and what is small, about who is important and who's not important, about what is first and what is last. You see, you want to be at the top, you got to get to the bottom. And small is the new big. Remember when Jesus was entering Jerusalem and he was, we call it his triumphal entry right before his crucifixion. And it's a big deal. And Jesus calls two of his disciples to come over and says, listen, I want you to go into town and I want you to find this donkey and bring me the donkey. And I just, I just want you to kind of think about this. You know, when Jesus looks and says, I got a job for you two guys. And you're thinking, Well, it's about time. This is good. Jesus is sending us on a mission. He wants me to pray fire down on somebody. He wants me to cast out a demon. He wants me to to do something big and spiritual. And Jesus says, hey, can you go pick up the donkey? And you're like, get a donkey. This is what my call is. You're calling me to go get, I'm on on donkey duty. All right. Uh, The size of the thing God is asking you doesn't determine the significance of your impact because what you might think is small can actually be big. You see, they didn't know that bringing Jesus a donkey is what would carry him to his calling. That donkey brought Jesus to his destiny. And so whatever God calls you to do, if Jesus is your focus, it's never small. It's never insignificant. Size doesn't determine the impact. And so I want to encourage you to do a couple of things tonight. One, if you've never taken the opportunity to sit down and write your testimony, I want to encourage you to write your testimony. What was your life like before Christ? How did you come to know Christ? And what has your life been since coming to Christ? And you don't need to write a book. It doesn't need to be 12, 14 pages and a half an hour long. It should be about three, four, five minutes, something that you could share with somebody. Write your testimony and think about this. What are some of the most significant changes in your life since being saved? How are you thinking differently? How have you now begun to live differently? And then the third one is this. What is your do? What is your do? What has God called you to do? Understand, grounded in Him. But here's what he's asked of me. What is your calling to serve? And when we put those things together, it's amazing what God will do. Listen, God changed Abram to Abraham, which means the father of many, when he was the father of none. God sees our true selves. And there are people who are going to laugh at me. Why are you changing me to the father of many? I don't have any kids. God, this doesn't make sense. He's, oh, your wife too. And her name is now Sarah, the princess, the mother of nations. And it's like, God, she's not pregnant. We don't have any children. Why would you do this? And they ended up having a child, Isaac. And when he was of age, he married Rebecca. And they had a child named Jacob, who was a supplanter, meaning someone who takes from someone else. And when it and when it came from when he was born, Esau, his brother, came out first and Jacob was holding on to his foot, trying to change positions with him so he could be born first. And he ends up living up to the name that he was given because later in his life, he deceives his father, steals the birthright and the blessing from his brother. And one night he's actually going back. It's been many years. He's going back to meet his brother. He doesn't know if his brother's going to embrace him or, or, or strike him down. You know, this is, this is, I don't know how this is going to go. And he actually takes all of his possessions and he breaks them up into two different groups. And the whole premise is this. Hey, if he attacks one, the rest of you run. If he attacks this one, you guys run. So that's some of us live. And he, he, the night before, he kind of goes off and he's having a, a quiet moment. And all of a sudden it says, and an angel appears and he wrestles with God. He wrestles with this angel and God changes his name from Jacob to Israel, one who wrestled with God. God changes our lives. 
It's amazing what God can do. In the book of Judges, there's a guy named Gideon hiding in a wine press, uh, threshing wheat. Why? Because he was terrified of the enemy. He was terrified of the Midianites who were oppressing the people of God. And the angel shows up and says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And he's like, what are you talking? I'm hiding from the enemy, trying to eke out this living, squeak out this, uh, this survival. And you're showing up calling me mighty warrior. In John 1, Jesus makes a young fisherman named Simon, and then he tells him that his name no longer is going to be Simon, but it's going to be Peter or Cephas, which means rock. Now, Peter was anything but a rock. He was, he was hot-tempered. He was emotionally up and down. He was not someone who I thought stable and consistent. You just didn't know if he was going to try, turn on you and run or whip out a sword and chop off your ear. You just never know what Peter was going to do. Why would God change all of these people's names? Why would God do that in Abram and Sarah and, and, and Jacob? Why would God do that in Gideon? Why would God speak to them and call them something that they aren't in the moment? And it's because this, God knew who they truly were and God knew who they would become and what they needed to do. See, God changed their name because change starts with your identity. You know, you do what you do because of how you think of you. So for them, they needed to do and they needed to think the right things about their lives so that they could become the right things. You need to know your true identity so you start to think the right things about your life. Because if you don't start with your identity, we just try changing our behaviors and just doing that doesn't last. We have to change the way that we think. We've got to put some feet on it. So here we go like this and say this. You know what? I don't want to gossip anymore. So I'm going to really try hard not to gossip. I'm just not going to do it. And you know what? That probably works until the first time you hear some really juicy gossip. And you're like, oh, that's, that's good. It just, it's doomed to fail. Thinking like that, talking like that. I just want to try not to gossip. It doesn't work. you got to ground it into something. you got to put the who before the do. And so what if instead of saying, I'm going to try hard not to gossip, what if you said this? You know what? As a child of God, I'm called to love and I'm called to speak well of others. And because of who I am in Christ... I'm going to use my words to build people up, not tear people down, because there's life and death in my tongue. All of a sudden, you got the right who before you get to the do. And I'm telling you, that makes a difference. You want a better marriage? And, and here's my whole thing. First of all, what does that even mean? Well, we just want a better marriage. Well, what does that mean? Define it. What does a win look like? So because I am a godly spouse, I'm going to pray with my spouse da daily and we're going to connect to some other godly couples and we're going to walk out life and we're going to learn how to be better and grow in that. See, it's the who before the do. Because of who we are in Christ, we can live different than the world. Who before the do? Someone offers you a cigarette and you say, no thanks, I'm trying to quit. Well, well what does that say? I'm a smoker who's trying to do something different. What if the answer was, no thank you, I don't smoke? See, it's a whole different type of response. And why does that matter? Because it always starts with identity. It is the who before the do. So who do you want to be? Uh, tonight, sitting where you are, listen to this. Who do you want to be? If you just kind of write on a piece of paper, this is who I want to be as a man, as a woman, as a teen, as a, as a, as a young man, someone who's called to ministry, someone who's gifted to do these things. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to become? And what are the things that you want to see in your life? And how do you refine and define your identity tonight? Do you know who you truly are? Because maybe you need to listen for God to speak a name to you. Because God knows who you are. It is time to become the person that God has created you to be. And the awesome thing is God is already doing it. God's starting this new thing. He's already started it and He wants you to see it. He invites you to see it. And I love this. And I think sometimes that a lot of our anxiousness and stress in life is connected to identities that aren't right. If I'm trying to be something that I'm not, if I'm trying to fix something that I can't, it creates stress and anxiety in me because I know I'm not enough to do this. God, get the who right. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to become? And what are the things that you want to see in your life? Ask the Lord to show you. Ask the Lord to speak your name because God called them by their true identities because God knew their true identities. And I believe God will speak to you too. First Assembly, I love you and I bless you and I encourage you this week, tell somebody about Jesus.